at the risk of making all my sermons this summer part of a saga called The Vicar Learns to Garden, <laughs> I nevertheless have another observation that has to do with things I'm seeing in my yard and around the house across the street. I recently discovered, don't worry, I didn't get in any trouble. Eight o'clock was worried I, I got arrested or something. I recently discovered that New Lenox has a cap on how much and when you may water the grass in your yard. <laughs> Again, I've never dealt with this before because I grew up in Richmond, Virginia in the 80s and like everything in the 80s, there were no limits and excess water just got dumped all over the neighborhood lawns in an effort to keep up appearances. So that realization that this precious, luscious green grass that I am painstakingly learning how to mow with frightening regularity is going to very soon turn brown and start to die. And that lingers heavy on my heart. And you see, I have a tendency to have something called the July blues. Really, it bleeds into August as well. Because with that is when the heat is on, literally, this weekend. It's unwelcome heat after wonderful May and wonderful June. The luscious green foliage everywhere is now, with the stroke of July 1st, about to begin its slow, inevitable decline. And as I stand there, exasperated in the 100 degree heat, looking at a lawn cooking in the sun, a lawn I'm forbidden to water, <laughs> I feel like I'm watching the patient flatline before my very eyes. Before there can be springtime, that glorious springtime, before there can be resurrection, there has to be, of course, decline and death. It is the one consistent thing about creation that everything has a mortal end. And though we know that creation gives way to new life, dead soil, for example, will spring up new plants after winter has left it far behind. We are still, I think, allowed to wallow in the sacrifice and the declining health. This, of course, is the backdrop for a new kind of healing in Mark's gospel where Jesus' Galilean ministry begins, and it is a poignant human kind of healing. Up until this point in Mark's gospel, the healings were all about exercising demons, fixing a withered hand or two. Now the requests for Jesus' healing and his words hit very close to home. There are two here. This is called a Markan sandwich, which means one story is interrupted with another story in the middle. Seems like a mistake, or is it? Both stories have to do with women. One has suffered 12 years. The other has lived 12 years and now is about to die at 12 years. One is ostracized by her community. The other is beloved. And our English translation doesn't do the text very much justice. When Jairus says, my little daughter, the phrase should probably be read, daddy's little girl. Jairus, the father, is a man of the cloth, of the Jewish faith. Just like Nicodemus in John's Gospel, he is going out on a limb. Here he is in desperation. He may not know if Jesus is the Messiah or a crook, but at this stage he'll try anything because nothing gained, nothing lost. It is that leap of faith that will be the real magical power in this healing. And on the flip side, the poor hemorrhaging woman is on the other side of the spectrum from Jairus. Due to her 12-year illness, she is considered ritually unclean and impure. She's disallowed from public spaces, especially the temple, where she would have tried to seek a place for prayer or help from the clergy. In her desperate attempt, she too is going out on a limb and in her despair, grasping at straws, or we might say grasping at strands of Jesus' clothing, anything to get his attention. For in her desperation, what is there to lose? Nothing gained, nothing lost. She is already as good as dead in the eyes of the community. 
In both instances, Jesus is not only quick to respond with healing at their request, but he's also quick to say, your faith has made you well. That, for Jesus, is the real miracle. The inbreaking of God's heavenly kingdom is alive and well, where people on all ends of the societal spectrum, from the privileged leaders to the disparaged outcasts, are able to transform their faith and believe that Jesus the Christ can do something. Now, let me take a pause and say that I've always found that there is a lot of wisdom to be stoked from the James Bond movie theme songs. They always seem to provide an ironic, sometimes not too ironic, sometimes double entendre, mostly wisdom about this world. The same kind of wisdom that King Solomon might have liked, like the selections we heard in the Wisdom of Solomon this morning. For example, you only live twice, once for yourself and once for your dreams. Or another one, let the sky fall. When it crumbles, we will stand tall and face it together. I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to Let the sky fall. When it crumbles, we will stand tall and face it all together. Let the sky fall. How about if this ever-changing world in which we live in makes you give in and cry, then live and let die. But of course, this week, the one that stuck in my head is the little known song that's the title track from The Living Daylights. And it has been stuck in my head like an earworm all week. so perfect. The living is in the way we die. It takes that phrase, dying is how you live, and turns it on its ear, but it actually makes some kind of sense. I love it. The living's in the way we die. It's not so much about dying, but also the reverse. There's a grace in going through the death pangs, especially if it means you come out clean or healed on the other side. Following her healing and body Her illness, the woman in the crowd is told by Jesus to go in peace, a phrase we take for granted sometimes, even though it's the very last thing I say before I walk out of the church in worship. Go in shalom is what Jesus is saying. In the Hebrew sense, that word shalom doesn't just mean peace, it means wholeness. Go and be fully you, fully alive again. The woman's impurity is erased in her healing. And even though Jesus has risked his own purity just by coming in contact with her, he has instead given her a gift of life that goes far beyond a simple physical healing. After seasons of death in the community, the woman is resurrected, pure and whole, part of society again. And for the little girl, whether she was truly dead or simply in something like a diabetic coma, which would explain a lot in the text, the point is still the same. Through the faith of her father, Jesus is able to enter the home and stare down death and even the threat of death and command the girl to wake up. The child's healing is, for Mark's gospel, the first foreshadowing that as far as Jesus is concerned, death has no dominion, even if death is allowed to proceed to its normal conclusion. In these healing narratives, the woman in the crowd and Jairus' daughter 
and indeed Jairus, demonstrate that with even the most basic faith that rests on the hope that maybe this will do something, the living really is in the way you die. And I hope that not only for this hapless, water-deprived gardener in waiting, but you as well may approach the oppressive heat and the scorched earth of July not simply to be about dying, but about creating a space for new life to arrive. Amen.